I'm really looking forward to today, and I've already done it once, and I'm still looking forward to sharing this message with you today. We're kicking off a new series for the month of October. We just wrapped up our vision series uh, for September about know Jesus, so Jesus, and that's something that will continue to permeate through us as a culture of who we are and what we're doing, how we're moving forward. And, and today we're gonna kind of continue on this idea, and, and not on know Jesus, show Jesus, but what that looks like. And so we have a series for the month of October that I'm particularly looking forward to, to sharing and discussing with you. Uh, and I wanna kind of set up, take some time to kind of set up what this looks like today and what it means. And, and, and it kind of actually comes down to some core truth of what we believe as, as, as Christians, as, as followers of Jesus. You know, we're here today uh, at, because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus was born to a virgin, that he grew up to be a man at 30 years old, he started his ministry, that he lived this life, he preached, and it ended with him dying on the cross only to go to that grave and to be resurrected and brought to new life and is now currently seated at the right hand of the Father. Like These are the truths that we believe. And Jesus said that he came for the truth and that the truth will set us free, that he died so that you and I could be free from the power of sin in our lives so that we could be free from the, even the sting of what death creates, that there is a hope of eternity that exists because of who Jesus is in us and that this freedom is something that we can experience that can only truly be experienced through the power of what Jesus is, that he sets us free. And I don't know if you've ever been caught in something that you can't get rid of, caught in something that you can't escape, uh, whether it's a, a, a habit or a, a, a behavior type or a relationship, or you, you fill in the blank, but there is something that is so powerful that happens when Jesus comes and he frees you from something. And he creates this freedom in your life. And, and maybe you're here today and you're struggling right now. I wanna tell you, and this is not even the message, there is freedom for you that can only be found through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That there is no chain that he cannot break. There is no oppression that he cannot overcome. There is nothing in your life that Jesus cannot free you from. And he can result in you having a peace that passes all understanding and joy that comes from only knowing that your eternity is secure in the hands of a God who loves you. Like this is the, the reality of what Jesus has and there's this freedom that comes. But there's something that happens within our lives. There's, there's something that comes in our lives that after we receive this freedom, we're, we're given an opportunity that we're gonna talk about here and, and, it, and it's different because here's what happens. I don't, I don't know about you. I can only speak from my personal uh, ideas that I can get set free from something. But if I then in my process, I just continue to allow myself to dictate what I do, how I behave, what I walk, what I see, what I look at, I, I somehow will have the propensity to go straight back to the very thing I just got freed from. Or, or maybe something that looks very similar. Because there's something known. This, this is actually a, 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 an occurrence that happens in the natural. Like there's people who through their life choices and life scenarios and some things that are, are up to them and some things that are not, they end up for a long period of time in prison, incarcerated, and they get freedom and you think that they would be so excited to be free, but it is very common that in the, as a result of experiencing that freedom and it being freedom being the thing that is unknown, that they do the first thing they can to get sent back to prison because that is the thing that is known and comfortable. And for you and I who are free, that seems crazy. But we often go to what is known and comfortable even if we know it's not the best because at least it's known. And we get what we expect. I'll give you an example that maybe prison is not what you understand. But many of you travel, you go on vacations, you, you drive. I know travel's been a little weird lately, but you do that. And here's the thing. You go to these other cities, you go to these other states, you drive around, and there's all these different places where that you can eat, like local places that you can eat, and yet you still end up at Olive Garden and Cracker Barrel and the blessed Chick-fil-A. Why? Is it because it's the best food that you can find at those places? No, we all know that it's not the best food, but we know what we can expect. I know when I go into Cracker Barrel, I can get the chicken tender grilled dinner with mac and cheese and hash browns. And I don't care what beautiful state of this country I'm in, it tastes exactly the same. It's like magic and it's delicious. Is it the best meal I've ever had? No, but I know what to expect and I get it. And sometimes this is like the very 
nature of who we are. We, we go to what we feel is safe and comfortable, even if we know it's not the best. And so Jesus comes and he gives you freedom. He gives you freedom with no chains attached. He says you are free because of who I am. I've paid the price of your sin. You are bold, uh, able to boldly enter into the throne room of grace. You are free. And for some of us, depending on when we get saved or, or where our life story is, it is the first time we've ever touched something like this. But, but all of a sudden, we find ourselves going back to the very things that we were doing before we were free. The same fears or the same habits or the same things. And God's grace is there for the forgiveness of those things time and time and time again. But he, he actually has something better. He has something better than you just going back and repeating the same lifestyle forgiven. He, he has something better for you. And it's something that we, we don't li like, but it's something that we're gonna focus on for this month. Because you see, we've talked about as a church, there's three major things that we're focusing on. We're focusing on Sunday services, that we believe this is, this is what we exist to do, Sunday services, to come together, to worship together, to pray together, to be encouraged together, to hear from God and use that as a rallying point of what we're doing. We also believe in the power of, of, of relationships and life-giving relationships, that through small groups and serving and friendships and going out to coffee, that you guys can grow and we can grow and develop and challenge each other in our faith. We believe in that. But there's a third thing that we're beginning to unpack as a church and we believe that it's important and it can look different in different areas but it's the idea of surrendered living of living a life that is surrendered to God and, and, and this is a, a terminology that if you've grown up in church you've probably heard it you've probably heard sermons talked about it you've probably heard it like it's a concept that's familiar but I want to look at it in a, in a different way because here's the thing Jesus set you free and then he offered you an opportunity in freedom to turn that freedom over and surrender it over to God and say, God, have your way in my life. I know that by my own decisions, I'll, I'll make choices that are not the best because I'm flawed. And I'll go to the things that are comfortable and I'll stay away from the things that seem difficult or hard or scary because that's human nature. But God has something for you. He has a will for you. He has a purpose for you that is bigger and better, that he has things that you can experience in this life that are greater. But many times it comes down to saying, God, you've set me free. And out of my own free will, I'm asking you to, to have your way in my life. And I want to read this quote uh, today from Oswald Chambers from his book, My Utmost First Highest. I read this in Pastor Steve's newsletter this week and I thought this is perfect timing. It says this, surrender is not the surrender of the external life, but of the will. When that, when that is done, all is done. There are very few crises in life. The great crisis is surrender of the will. God never crushes a man's will into surrender. He never beseeches him. He waits until man yields up his will to him. That battle never needs to be refought. You see, the moment that in our lives we truly understand that Christ has given us freedom, and then with that freedom we say, God, have your way in this part of my life, we begin to see the goodness and the fruitfulness that God has for us. We begin to realize that he has a plan for us, that he has a will for us, that he has a calling for us, that he expects greater, that he has good things for us, and that what we do in this process is not a matter of trying to earn more love or earn more salvation or do these certain things so we can get more rewards in heaven, but know that God has a plan and a will for us that is for us to experience his goodness here on earth. And, and what we're invited to do is to surrender, to surrender, to surrender your ways, your thoughts, your actions, your preferences, and to say, God, have your way. Ha have your way. Let your will be done in my, my life. And, and here's the thing. Surrender is a word that we're familiar with. The dictionary defines surrender has a couple different definitions. It says to yield to the power, control, or possession of another upon compulsion or demand. And the second definition, it says to give oneself over to something such as an influence. 
we're, we're familiar with the term surrender. We use the term surrender. We, we talk about it. But surrender, the word itself, it is not a word that we took this Greek word and we translated it and you see surrender in the Bible. In fact, surrender is not a word that's in the Bible a lot. The idea, the concept, the lifestyle of surrender is what we see defined and lived out over and over and over again. We, we see people living a lifestyle of get, putting down their desires and their thoughts and their ways and inviting God to do something that is better, even when they can't see it, even when they can't understand it, even when it doesn't look like it's possible, and we see it time and time and time again. And the Bible has story after story of flawed humans who do not get it right, but at the end of the day, they surrender to God's will in their life whether it's Abraham and Sarah believing that they can have be the father and the mother of many generations, whether it's David believing that he can slay a giant, whether it's story after story that they're gonna see God's faithfulness, Joseph in the prison believing that he'll still see God's goodness in his life even though he's in a prison. We have story after story of people surrendering their way to allow God to do something in their life. And we see God's goodness show up over and over again. And that's why Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So many times we allow trends and, and, and things that we see uh, or ideas that we read about to be the things that we think, if I can, I can get my life in order if I just follow this, this trend or this 10-step thing or this health plan or this diet or if I join this club or if I go to this thing, like if I get to this place, like, like then I'll begin to see the fruit. And God's saying, don't copy the behavior of the world. Allow God to transform your mind. Now, here's the thing. Are doing those things that I said bad? No. They're not. They could even be God's plan for you. But I'll know when I submit my way of doing it to allow him to be what tells me what to do. And then I see the most fruitfulness. You see, we can see the fruitfulness in a way that transforms our lives when we surrender what we believe and allow God to be something that defines it in our life. And I wanna look at this more through, through a, a lifestyle of, of, of one person. Because there's many people, like I said, their story is filled with characters who surrendered their will, who said, God, not, not my plan, but your plan. And some of them tried to help God along the way. I don't know if you noticed. A Abraham tried to help God when he had, you know, a baby with somebody else. Yes, God, I surrender to your will. I think I'm gonna uh, sleep with my maidservant. Sometimes we like to help God. Has anyone else ever tried to help God? Sometimes God tells me something and I try to help God along the way. Yes, God, I get it. Wait on you. And by wait on you, you mean to go out and do it myself, correct? Oh, no, that's not what you meant. You meant to literally wait on you? Oh, okay, sorry. I made a mistake. Please forgive me. Thank you for your goodness, Grace. But there's one character, there's one person who demonstrates the essence of allowing the Father to work. And we're gonna read this story in a second, but I want to remind you of one thing, and you maybe, if you've been here for a while, you've maybe heard this say this. We believe that, that God, the, 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 the theological term, we, we believe in the Trinity. We believe that there's the triune God, that there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they are one, but they are three, that they each have their own purpose, and, and, and their separate calling and how they work in our lives and how they interact in a really, really simple way that I heard many years ago that has just stuck with me is that, that that kind of explains the role in which they play our lives is that God the Father, he plans things, that God the Son performs those things and that the Holy Spirit perfects those things, that the Father plans things in your life, that Jesus performs those things in your life and the Holy Spirit is perfecting those things in your life. 
life. If you look at the ultimate goal, which is salvation, that from the very moment, it said that the moment that man sinned, that God enacted his plan to recall us back, that Jesus Christ came and performed that with the life and the death and the resurrection of who he lived. And in that time, when those people are now accepted through the salvation of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is working inside of you, perfecting you day and day in and transforming you closer and closer into his glorious image, that this is how they interact together in your life. And, and I want us to keep that in mind in the back of our minds because I want to read this. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. This is right after the Passover supper where Jesus shared communion. It says, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Said this in the NIV, he said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently and was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so you don't give into temptation. Here in this moment with a story that I'm sure you've, you've heard, and there's another account that gives us some extra details or different details in Matthew. Jesus is here and in this time knowing that the cross is near. Knowing that the very purpose in which he was born and lived this life to this moment is coming, he takes this time and he asks, if you're willing, God, take this cup from me. The New Living says this cup of suffering. The Old King James, I believe, says this bitter cup. And you have to understand, Jesus was about to experience, and he knew what he was about to experience. He knew he was going to the cross, and he was about to experience something that is very physically painful. The cross is a terrible death, only reserved for traitors and slaves. Roman citizens were not allowed to be killed on the cross. It was considered too cruel. I watched the video where they took an experiment and they took a healthy young man in his either late 20s, early 30s, and they wanted to see what kind of physical strain was put on the body when he went on the cross. And so, of course, they did not beat him like Jesus' body was beaten. They did not uh, withhold sleep from him or food from him like Jesus' body was. And then they just literally used straps to put him on a cross. They did not pierce his hands or pierce his feet. And this young man who was in great physical shape, he was good. He got there, I believe, as I recall, he lasted about seven minutes before his heart rate was so high they were afraid that he was going to go into cardiac arrest. And his oxygen levels went to a point where they were afraid that he was going to suffocate. Seven minutes. He didn't even have the worst physical pain done to him. He hadn't been beaten. But yet, despite knowing that was coming, when Jesus says, take this cup of suffering away from me, he's not speaking about the pain of the cross. He's speaking to what Jeremiah spoke about, which was the judgment, the cup of judgment and suffering that had to be drank in order to pay for the price of the wage of sin. You see, at that cross, not only was Jesus about to experience a physical death that you and I could probably not bear or handle, Jesus was going to experience an agony that we cannot fathom because it is in that moment that every sin of every person from once and for all was going to be paid upon the body of Jesus. And for the first time, Jesus was not only going to have to experience sin, but more importantly, he was going to experience the consequence of sin, which was separation from the Father, which he had never experienced. He said, please take this cup away from me. But then he said, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And in this moment, surrendering to God, notice Jesus didn't say, make my will your will. 
And obviously, it wasn't a sin for Jesus' will to be different than what God's will. Sometimes we think if we want something maybe different than what God, like we're, we're making a mistake. No. Not my will, but your will be done. And then he literally began to pray in such anguish and such torment with such physical and emotional and spiritual stress that he literally, this isn't like he literally began to sweat blood. And doctors and science will tell us this is literally a condition that people can experience in the most extreme stressful situation. But what happens after is interesting because the moment he walks through this and he submits himself and he says to God, not my will, but your will be done. You notice for the rest of the story, and we don't have time to read the whole story today, Jesus never fights. He never backtracks. He says in Matthew, like when they, they come and like his, his disciples are like, no, not you, Jesus. And Peter starts cutting people's ears off. He's like, no, we don't need to do this. He said, don't you know that I could call down a legion of angels if I wanted to? But I'm not going to. Because not my will, but his will be done. And Jesus never fights, never defends, and willingly lays down his life at the cross for the sacrifice of others. In fact, Hebrews gives us this insight. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Scorning its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, once he made the decision to surrender to God, he then began to just walk out the path and the will that God had for him, but there was a moment in that garden where he had to, a choice. My way or your way, God? My way or your way? And Jesus, the man who I want to be like the most, said, not my will, but your will be done. And if there was anyone who you would think could be trusted to have their own will, it would be Jesus, the son of God. If there's anyone who didn't need to do anything to be loved by God, it would be Jesus. Because guess what? God already told them, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, my beloved son. Jesus could not be more loved by the Father than he was in that moment. And yet in this time, Jesus still said, not my will, but your will be done. And I just think about John chapter 8, verse 28, where Jesus said this, when you've lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you'll understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own but say what the Father taught me. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Jesus, the one who was with God, the one who was the word of God, if anyone should be able to go out as a man or as a woman and walk out in their will and they should do a pretty good job of being Jesus, but Jesus said, nothing that I say comes from anywhere other than the Father. Everything that I do is the will of God, and it pleases them. It is not because he is deity. It is because in his life, he exemplified the character of God, that he walked in who he was, and he laid down his way and his will and surrendered fully to his Father. Surrendered fully to his Father. And we... I sometimes have a struggle with surrender because I think I know better or, or because I think I've got a good idea or because I went to college or because it's right here or because it's convenient or because it's just culturally who, who we are. You, you see, we as believers and we as Americans and we as Western people, we usually really get excited when we talk about freedom. And freedom is important. I am not belittling the freedom because that is what Jesus came to break the chain of captivity on you and the freedom. We get excited about the freedom. Like it's in our culture and DNA. When we talk about freedom, we want to paint ourselves like Braveheart and wave flags around and yell freedom really loud. And we're like fired up about it. <laughs> like that's who we are. Your ancestors, if you were born in this country, your ancestors came here because they were freedom people. 
If there were freedom people in other people, places, you know what they did? They left that place and they got kicked out to here where they could be with other crazy freedom people. Like that is what's going on. And I want, I want you to know, I'm not making political statements. I'm not making COVID statements. This is not what I'm talking about because well, the freedom we're talking about is the freedom that comes from relationship with Christ. Okay, that'll transform your life. It's different. So I'm not talking about what you can and can't do and what people tell you to do and not do. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about a relationship with the creator of the heaven and the universe, that he died for freedom, and we embrace freedom, and our Western culture embraces freedom because we believe in the equality of men and women. We believe that you should not be treated differently because of your socioeconomic standards or because of the color of your skin. Like, we believe in the freedom that comes, and that is what Christ preaches, and that is what he died for. That is why we, some of us go to the fair, and some of us don't, but we're still all here because we love Jesus. We embrace freedom. But then when Jesus says, now that you're free, though I could demand a price, I won't. But I've lived a life where I can show you that the best thing to do with your freedom is turn it over to my father, the planner. And let him show you what he has for you. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. They're not the ways of this world. They're not the thoughts of this world. They're not the way that things do that he, he uses the wise things to confound those who he thinks are wise and he uses foolish things to change hearts and minds. God is different. He says you can surrender by surrendering, will you get any more love from God? No, you cannot love, be loved any more than you are right now. Will you get greater rewards in heaven because you surrendered to God? No, you won't. Or will you get a picture of you painted in heaven because look at how much sacrifice you did in your surrender? No, you won't. He cannot love you anymore. But in surrendering to God in your daily life and saying, God, I kind of want to do this thing. It seems good to me. But not my will, but your will be done. What would you have me do? What would you have me do? We put ourselves into the place of vulnerably trusting a God who's been faithful to be good to you. And you begin to experience his goodness in your life. We, we begin to experience the result of saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. And, and the result of that is you living a deeper, richer, more fulfilled life here on this earth. Not because he's blessing you, but because you're walking in the path and the goodness that God has. Because you're allowing him to define what is right and wrong in your life. Because he knows the future and he can guide your steps. And even when things can look hard or painful or scary, we know that we are with the one who's there. I love the lyric of the song that we said Today it says that I won't bow down to idols, I'll stand and worship you. And if that puts me in the fire, then I know you're there too. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Because you are with me. You see, in our life of surrendered living, sometimes we may give up things that we hold really dear. Because they're actually not God's best for us. Sometimes we can get away from the things that were only there because we're settling with the comfort of what is known as opposed to the things that are unknown and are scary. But God says, I love you too much to leave you here. I love you more than to keep you attached to this thing or this relationship or this person or this idea. You have a freedom that comes from being in relationship with me. Allow me to show you how to live the good life. And sometimes it's scary. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes he asks us to give up things that you re don't realize how attached you are until he asks you to give it over to him. Surrendered living is great when you've already surrendered the ideas. <laughs> until he comes and steps on the toes of the thing that you still are connected with, or you identify with, or you're passionate about, or it served you well to this point, or you're comfortable with.
but when we allow God to change our lives and we say what Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done, God. It changes how we see our lives. It changes how we see our opportunity to show people Jesus. It changes our daily decisions. Church, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with this. I'm a know-it-all, I'm arrogant, I'm defensive, and so sometimes I just try to do my own way. And the natural, even if it's something I want to do, if someone tells me I have to do it, I'm just not going to do it because someone told me I had to do it. Even if I really want to do it. I've missed things that I really wanted to do for the principle of not being told what to do. because there's something inside of me that doesn't want to give up on what it thinks is best. But if anything, this life that I've lived has taught me is that I don't know what's best. I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what my family needs, but Jesus does. And he died so that I could be in relationship with the God of the universe desperately wants me to walk in the path that he has for me. And I have access. And, and here's how good Jesus is. This is how good God is. It's not like, well, now you got to use your willpower and pray every day and then God will tell you what to do and it's going to be really hard, but you can do it on your own. No. If that's what you think will happen of submitting yourself or surrendering to God, you're wrong or you'll just fail. I've done that. God's grace is so good that not only did he make a way for you to have access to the Father, to receive his will in your life, he then empowers you and strengthens you and encourages you. And when you make mistakes and when you fall short and when you get scared and when you don't choose the truth or when you decide to disobey or when you decide to do your own thing, even though you know that's not what God has for you, he is there to say, it's okay, you're forgiven, I love you, we're gonna get this together. I cannot tell you how many times I've said, God, what do you want me to do? And he says, this is what the path I'd like you to go. It's like, cool, yeah, that seems hard. I don't like it at all. I'm going to do this. And then what do you know? It didn't work out. So then I just keep doing it over and over and over. And then about the fifth or sixth time of God clearly saying, no, listen, I still love you. You're good. Like, you're not going to hell or anything. Like, I'm not punishing you, cursing you, kicking you when you're down. Like, this is all good. But like, this is the way you need to go and you keep going this way. At some point, all of a sudden, I run into the consequence of me just keep doing this thing over and over again in my life. And I'm like hurt or wounded or frustrated or tired. And then I have the audacity to say, God, where are you? God's like, bro, I'm back here where I asked you to go left and you just kept going right. Not punishing you. Here's the thing, God doesn't need to punish you. You punish yourself with your own terrible decisions. I punish myself with my own terrible decisions. But then even at this moment, his grace and his forgiveness is good enough to say, hey, do you want to come back over here and go to the left? Yes, God, I do. That's cool. Let's do it. No big deal. Nothing changed. My promises are yes and amen. My giftings are without repentance. This is who I am. And you say, oh, but I lost time. You're talking to the God who redeemed time, the God who is outside of time, the God who can do in one day what you could not do in a thousand days. You don't think he can catch you up from a few bad choices. We submit to him. We submit to him. Not, not my will, but your will be done, God. And I wish I could tell you he'll never ask you to do something that's hard. He'll never ask you to do something that's scary. He'll never ask you to do something you've never done. He'll never ask you to give up something that you love. Like, I wish I could tell you that that's what would happen, but I, I almost could tell you the exact opposite. Because you are not called to common things. You are called to things which are uncommon and holy. Representatives of Jesus Christ in this earth 
to show his goodness. You are called to live a life full of his goodness. And sometimes the thing that I encourage you is the principle that we can walk in is the thing that my wife and I, we thought we were teaching our kids this principle because it was good to teach kids. Um, and then all of a sudden we realized God was actually teaching us a lesson, which it was the concept of first time obedience. Maybe you have kids. It's like first time obedience because first time obedience is great. And, and really we told them that just because I didn't want to argue with my argumentative kids all the time. So first time obedience, first time obedience, first time obedience. First time obedience is what gets you to the path of goodness the quickest and removes the path of pain the fastest. That's what I taught my kids over and over again. And all of a sudden one day God was like, do you remember what you taught your kid about first time obedience? When they don't first time obey, do you love them any less? No. Are they less your son or daughter? No. They're still in your family. Yeah. Do you wish they would choose first time obedience because you know what's best for them and they have no clue what's going on because they're silly little children? Yeah. I would love for you to obey first time. Not because I'm a cruel God who's looking to spank you, but because I'm a loving Father who would love for you to see the good things I have for you in your life. So surrender. We're going to talk over the next month about some specific areas in our life and what surrender looks like. And a couple of those I already have down, a couple of those... I'm just praying and asking God to, to lead me in what specifically what, because we could talk about surrender from now until Jesus comes back. Because surrender is really easy when I'm talking about the thing you've already surrendered to God. But when I come to the thing that you have created, not just not lack of surrender, but a fortification, and Jesus is saying it's time to break down that wall, that's the one where like, I don't like this anymore. I don't like this church, I don't like him, his shirt is silly. something for you. I believe your life will not be the same when you surrender to God. And I believe you'll see the fruitfulness of walking in an intimate relationship knowing Jesus. And in that surrender, in that surrender, you'll see that he has good things And you'll get to look back on some of the things that you wouldn't let go of, that you wouldn't stop, that you thought were important. You'll get to look back at those things and say, wow. Look what freedom looks like. I didn't even know I was captured. Until today, I see what true freedom looks like. Let's bow our heads. There's one thing I want to do before we dismiss today. If you're here and you haven't accepted Jesus, the first thing we can do in finding freedom and creating an opportunity to live a life in which we surrender to God. That's accepting his gift of salvation. So I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads for just a second, and we're all going to repeat this prayer, and this is you. I just want you to pray this with your heart. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins so I can be forgiven and free. So in Jesus' holy name we pray. With every head bowed for just a second. If you're here today and you made that decision, would you raise your hand up real high in this auditorium so this week I can just pray for you. And thank God for the decision you've made today. If that's you, anywhere in the auditorium, just real high, raise your hand up. All right, any hands that are up can go down. Father God, for everyone else who's here, who's accepted Jesus. Thank you for your gift of freedom, salvation. Lord, help us in that freedom. Surrender ourselves to you. Lord, let you be the one who defines good and bad in our lives. Let you be the one who leads us and guides us who transforms us into your glorious image. 
so that we can experience your good and pleasing and perfect will. Help our prayer and our heart posture be not our will, but your will be done. Let us walk in your goodness every day. And when we can't do it on our own, when we fall short and when we need help, thank you that Jesus is there with forgiveness. And thank you that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, perfecting us every day. That you surround us. It's in your holy name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, church, know this. You're very loved. You are very prayed for. Serve team members who are coming tonight. Cannot wait to hang out with you tonight and talk with you. For everyone else, you are dismissed, and we will see you next Sunday. Have a great rest of your day.